Welcome to Bet on It. I am Kelly Stewart. It is week 18 of the NFL season. We've got a lot to unpack, and we're also going to do a little quick segment on the national championship game because I personally think it matters more than all of week 18 combined. Let's bring in VR. You guys know him from our weekly gold segment in the old school watchers. Remember that he once was on this panel every single week with us. Yanni the Greek at Greek underscore gambler on Twitter. Joe Ranieri at Joe Ranieri on X, whichever way you prefer to call it these days. Uh, I would like to send one quick note. Marco D'Angelo is out this week. Unfortunately, he had a death in the family. So I'd like to send some well wishes and some prayers his way. And thank you to VR for filling in last minute for us. We always appreciate you and your gold. So now we get you for an entire show. We're going to get right into these primetime games. Saturday night, Houston at Indianapolis. This one has flipped. Indianapolis opened a one-point favorite. Now Houston is a one-point favorite and on the Wager Talk odd screen is headed to one and a half. Total about 47. We are seeing some money come in on this under. Are we not here, VR? Yeah, we did. Um, we are seeing some money come in on the under, and more importantly, on the Houston side, which has flip-flopped this line. That is definitely steam on Houston confirmed, and it makes sense to me because even though you're looking at two teams with pretty much identical records and almost identical records against the betting market, uh, against metrics-wise, Houston's the better team. I like to look at uh, the one of the best correlations to winning in the NFL, offensive passing success rate and defensive passing success rate, because if you could get decent yards in, on first down and second down, you're more likely to head down the field and score. So it's one of those metrics that does make sense to correlate with victory, and Houston is just better on both sides of the ball. On the offensive side of the ball, they're much better. Offensive passing success rate, defensive side of the ball, Passing success rate, much better. It's just series-wise, Indianapolis has owned this series. And the fact they're at home is why they came out as the favorite. But there's no home field advantage here for the Colts. They're 4-4 four and four at home, and they're 4-3 and three on the road. So they've done just as well at home as they've done on the road. I want to see a team that's 0-8 on the road, 8-0 at home. That's home field advantage, not a team that's 4-4 four and four, no matter where they play. Well, that home field advantage out the window. I like Houston as well here. I haven't bet it yet, um, but it's either Houston or pass. Yeah, I would have to agree. C.J. Stroud last week, return of Nico Collins. Hey, looked like a nice, easy win there over the Titans. Even got Mike Rabel fired up after that mm -hmm. one, Joe Ranieri. I have been very hard on Gardner Minshew this year, very hard. And he has made me eat my words. So I am kind of afraid to step in front of this Colts team once again. I will say this, if it gets up to – uh, probably two. I may put the Colts in a teaser. Your thoughts on this AFC South matchup, Joe? Well, first, we love urgency, right, in all of sports. And it doesn't get any bigger than this game here on a Saturday because you're looking at it's a playoff elimination game. The winner is in. The loser gets to make tea time and book trips to Aruba because that's basically what's coming up here. And the winner also has a chance to actually take down the AFC South because if the Jags lose on Sunday, then... Not only does the winner of this game make the playoffs, they also win the division. So a ton on the line, but I'm with VR. Go back to the first meeting between these two in week two. It was 31 to 20, and yet the Texans dominated every statistic that matters in the game. They ran more plays. They had more third down conversions. They owned the time of possession. But the problem was they kept fumbling the damn ball and turning it back over, giving uh, this team an opportunity to be able to pull away from them. And ultimately, they just could not recover. But I don't seem to think that Minshew is going to go 2-0 or the Colts are going to go 2-0 against Houston this year. I think Houston rebounds. They've gained a ton of experience this year. Coaching, C.J. Stroud, they're all coming into their own. A little concerned about Huntsville not playing, some issues on the offensive line. But for the most part, I would have never thought the Colts would go 2-0 and against them this year. I still don't. It would be Houston or pass. All three of us, Houston or pass, unless, of course, I can get the Colts in a teaser. Week 18 is really tough to navigate, but here's one that, well, I don't think is as tough. Sunday mm. night, the Bills, three-point favorites at the Dolphins to determine the AFC East. Joe Ranieri, 
I had an opportunity to hedge my plus 275 ticket and didn't. Now I might be a little sweaty come Sunday night. Uh, I want to cheer for the Dolphins here, but I am not doubling down and putting more money on Miami, not without Raheem Mostert, not with Tyreek Hill in a walking boot on social media because his house yes. is on fire. Tua Tonga Bailoa, we know, is banged up as well. That's also a concern. Help me break down this AFC East matchup here because the Bills kind of, it's almost win or don't get in. They have uh, a couple other things that they need to go their way. If the Steelers lose to the Ravens and the Jags lose to the Titans, they can still get in, I believe. Yeah, yeah. So, it's, it, listen, it, there's much more urgency for Buffalo here because Miami's already qualified for the postseason, right? So, Buffalo needs to control their own destiny, win this game, and they're in. But instead of trying to figure out a side and what the ER report is for Miami here, I am going to focus on the total because it is starting to drop a little. It opened up 50, 50 and a half. We're starting to see it down to 49 and a half. And I agree with the move. This is much more playoff atmosphere style football than what we saw a couple of weeks uh, or a month and a half ago when uh, Miami went up to Buffalo after dropping 70 on Denver here. The list reads ridiculous between Waddle, between Mostert, a, a you know, I got guys sending me the helicopter photos right now in Miami on the news uh, showing Tyreek Hill. He's hobbling around as there's smoke coming out of his house uh, in a walking boot right now. So he's not 100%. To his shoulder is not 100% as he left against the Ravens. So all in all, anybody see the Buffalo Bills play offense recently? Is this a team that looks like they are a well-oiled machine? I don't know how the hell we're getting to 50 points in this game. I think it's much tighter. I think there's more on the line than there was six, seven weeks ago. So if I'm going to play this game, I'm looking at the under here. I don't think we get to 49 and a half. I don't think it's a track meet at all. Interesting. I actually would have to agree with that looking at uh, Allen's numbers over the last couple of weeks. They haven't been impressive. And obviously with all the injuries to the Miami side of the ball, VR, you mentioned passing success rate, and the Miami Dolphins were at the top of that list every time you and I did the gold segment, but they have also kind of fallen off a little bit here. Are they still high on your list over the last few weeks, and do you think they're worth a play here on Sunday night? Yes, they're still up there, but you're right. They're not number one. San Francisco's above them right now with Purdy, even though he will not be playing. That's now just been confirmed. Uh, on Sunday for San Francisco. That's neither here or there. Back to Buffalo, Miami. Bottom line is this. I have a future on Buffalo. I have a future on them to win the Super Bowl. So I'm a little bit biased. I want to see Buffalo win this game. But as the sports better, my loyalties to my pocket today. Like, I, I can't worry about that ticket. I placed it before the season started because I thought it was plus CV at that point. Where I stand today I think in this game, I got to take the Dolphins, Kel, or leave it alone. In fact, my subscribers will be getting a, a, a play on the Dolphins. I'm just waiting to see if I could get three in a hook because three of the last nine wins Buffalo's had in this series been by three. A Buffalo's owned this series, but a lot of those games have been pretty close. Um, with that said, I talked about extremes, home field advantage, Buffalo, three and four away, seven and one at home. Strong home field advantage. Miami, exact same thing. They're four and three on the road, seven and one at home. So you have opposite ends of the spectrum where Buffalo is much stronger at home, and now they're on the road where they've played their worst. And they're playing Miami, who's played their best at home. And guess what? Miami's at home, and Tua has been given the green light. But all the talk is Miami's clinched. They, they'd they have nothing to play for. Who cares? Well, if they could ruin Buffalo's season, they have something to play for. If they're in primetime Sunday night at home against a division rival, they have something to play for. And the fact that we know the look-ahead line was a pick em, and now it's a key number of three, we know that the, the fact that Buffalo's in a must-win has been baked into the cake. In fact, they quantified it by giving them a field goal. I think that's just way too much. Must-win situations put a lot of pressure on teams. You're, you're almost the perfect storm not to cover. You have pressure of needing the win, so you can't make a mistake. 
and the market's usually charging a premium in that spot. So sure, I could cheer them in. I want to see Buffalo win the game for biased reasons on my future, but I'm here to give betters and uh, viewers value, and I'm going to be betting Miami on Sunday night. I like to hear that for my futures bet because, well, unfortunately, when I went to the window to hedge, the line dropped 30 cents on me and I just couldn't do it. It is what it is at this point in time. Let's get into the national championship game. As I mentioned, we're going to touch on this because I think it's way more exciting than all of these week 18 games. And it is on Monday night, standalone, of course, Michigan, four and a half point favorites, total 55 and a half. VR, I'm going to go to you first. We saw this one tick up to Michigan plus five. You mentioned look ahead line. When I spoke to John Murray over at the Superbook a few weeks ago, he said Washington's going to be a six point underdog to Alabama. Washington would be a seven point underdog to Michigan. And then they marched out a three and a half and it got hit early. On the flip side, Washington's been an excellent underdog, five and zero against the spread, five and zero straight up with Kalen DeBoer. I like Washington here, but albeit a little uh, biased because I do have Joe Ranieri and I both have actually uh, tickets at seven to one for Washington to win the whole thing. Should we be coming back a little bit on that uh, with some Michigan money line? Listen, I'm just going to tell you who I like. I like a lot in this spot, Kelly. Um, it's hard to say you're getting a big plus CD bet on the side in the national championship game. The headline gives me a little comfort that this should have been higher. Granted, you're going to have to make an adjustment. They have played another game since that time. Um, but is it too significant? I kind of think so. I think the, the thinking going in, let's put the stats and X's and O's aside, is that Michigan won their biggest game last week. It was against Alabama. Like, that was the big obstacle. Can they win a playoff game? Sure, it's national championship aspirations, but having Alabama in front of them after getting there is like a big obstacle to overcome, beating the SEC. Um, and they did it. And it's kind of like, okay, now they got to get back up for Watson, who came through as an underdog. I just think Michigan, you're going to continue to get their best game because they've been playing their best, at least that's what the data says, down the stretch. And that hasn't changed. We saw it last week. And when I looked at offensive, defensive success rate, even adjusted for strength of schedule, Washington is a little better on the offensive side of the ball. But defensively, Michigan is just so much better that I really do think as the game goes on, they systematically break Washington and end up winning this game by double digits. I don't think the teaser is going to help you with Washington. I think Michigan wins this comfortably in the second half and just pulled away in the fourth quarter. I don't think we're going to be sweating it out down the stretch. I really do think uh, Michigan ends up running away with it. They're just so much the better team. And we all know power rating wise where Washington stands, how many teams would be favored over them on a neutral field. With that said, that's the randomness of team sports where you don't play five and seven game series. The, the, the best team doesn't always win the championship. That's why Washington can win this game. But I, I just think if they were to play this game 10 times, Michigan beats them straight off seven out of 10 times, if not eight out of 10 times on the money line. That makes it comfortable what it is right now. And equated to the point spread, I'll lay up the six on Michigan comfortably in this game. Yeah, and, and that goes with the look ahead line. I would agree with you, VR, from the power rating perspective, from the numbers perspective. But hey, they were, you know, double-digit underdogs in the Pac-12 championship yep. game, too. I don't understand uh, why bookmakers do not respect this team. Michael Piddix Jr., if we did Eisman voting today, he would uh, probably get a few more votes for that performance after Texas. Joe Ranieri, help me break down this national championship game because I feel like at this point I've got 7-1 to one on Washington. If it, anything, I would Ooh. come back with a little bit of money on Michigan – but it would take me, VR said he would lay up to six with Michigan. I think I needed at least six before I got to the window here with the Huskies. Yeah, well, it'll be interesting to see uh, where this line goes as the, uh, you know, as the limits start to increase here as, the, as we get a little bit closer. 
to the game. Uh, but I, just keep this in mind. These two are going to be playing each other next year in the Big Ten. I just want everyone to understand that we are actually seeing this ahead of time because, yes, Washington will be in the Big Ten next year. Let that sink in for a little while here. Invested with UCAL at 7-1 with Washington. I do think, and I'll, I'll focus on the total here, because I do think these things are correlated. I do think if you're looking at Michigan and thinking they're winning this game, this thing goes under because Michigan in no way, shape, or form has any interest in getting to a shootout with Washington. And Washington, although they can go up tempo, Washington will play like a chameleon. You want to go up tempo, we'll go. When we need to slow the game down because we're up double digits, we're not going to give you enough possessions in order to be able to beat us. So kudos to Kalen and DeBoer and the Panix and the Washington They are some of the best in-game adjusting, that coaching staff, the in-game adjustments have been absolutely phenomenal. But when's the last time we've seen a Michigan game go over 55? Um, I I just don't see that that's what Harbaugh wants to do here. I think Michigan, if we're going to lose, and Michigan's going to win out in this game and even wins by double digits, it's because the defense dominates, and I do not see how we're getting over 55 points in this game. So to me, it would be an under, and I would just keep it with the 7-1 and see if there's an in-game opportunity somewhere along the line to jump in. Yeah, I don't hate that. (laughs) Kel, let me add this. Here's what I think you should do, having that ticket in your hand and anyone with a Washington future. You're going to be able to get Michigan on the money line at a discount at kickoff. You can already get them at a discount right now. A minus five in college football equates to a money line of minus 201. And right now, I can get Michigan at minus 185 at some of the square shops. And the reason is obvious. In big games where the public money far outweighs the, the, the short money, the betters that are going to take the dog, they're, they're going to take a lot of money line action. Someone that doesn't bet college football all year but is going to bet this national championship game, when they walk up to the window with their $10, and they find out if they put their 10 and take the five points, they're only going to get back $9 and change. But if they take Washington to win the national championship, they're going to get back almost $20 plus their 10. Trust me, they're betting the money line. That's why you're already seeing it lower than what the point spread reflects. You'll see that continue as we head into Monday night. So you will get a discount on Michigan money line regardless of, I think, what this line does, whether it goes up or down, I don't think it's going to reflect what the number should be. I think money line betters on Michigan will get the best of it Monday. Love that for us. Ring in the new year by a month. Get a week free 37 days of all access with your favorite wager talk expert. There is no coupon needed, and that is valid through the 8th of January all right, I'm going to kick these guys out of here. It's time to bring in Ralph. Oh, wait, I'm back at home. So guess what I got? It's time for some TNA. At Cal Sports LV on Twitter, Ralph Dot Michaels something on Instagram. Damn it. I have been failing at Ralph's Instagram. If you guys send him direct messages, I'm not going to answer. But you know where he will answer on X. If you have a question for him in this TNA segment, you can always reach out to Ralph because that's why this segment exists. For you guys, Ralph, let's get into those streakers. Kelly, well, you said it. So let me just tell everyone right now, you guys got an entire week. If you have any questions about playoff TNA, reach out to me on Twitter, tag me. I'll put it in a list. We'll get through as much as I can. And I'll tell you this, if there's any positive results and I have too much data, I will put it in a guide. I will do a playoff guide listing a bunch of information. So first, let's start off with streakers. I'm surprised there's this many streakers. Shout out to my son, Jeff Michaels, at JM Sports CLE. He's been doing this all year long. Take a look at this, Kelly. Have you been on the Chicago Bears for six straight ATS wins? The Browns, Patriots, and Patriots with five straight wins. The Vikings and the Eagles with five losses. And the Green Bay Packers with six straight overs. You know, hey, my son reached out to me today, Kelly. I'm going to throw in two more streakers that aren't on this list, and one of them shocked the hell out of me. There's only one team in the NFL that is 7-0 over-under on the road. 
That is one team, and guess what team it is? It is my Cleveland Browns. They have the number one defense, and they are 7-0 and on the road, going over by 16 points per game. And there's only one team that is a perfect 7-0 and over-under at home. That's the Arizona Cardinals. They're at home this week as well. So a little home-road dichotomy throwing into the streakers there. But, Kelly, are you as shocked as I am that the number one defense in the NFL, the Cleveland Browns, are not only 7-0 and over-under on the road, but they have gone over by 16 points per game. That is crazy, but I think that also plays into the bookmakers knowing that the general public is going to want to bet the um, unders with the best defense in the NFL. So naturally, they make those just a little too low. Absolutely. You know, and I, I do want to say this before we get to our chart, Kelly. This is the one week that I look at trends and angles and systems the least out of the entire season. Some teams, this is like preseason. Some teams want to win. Some teams don't care to win. It doesn't mean if you don't care to win that you're not going to win. But let's take a look at what I came up with the final nerd chart for the 2023 regular season. I just wanted to break down how home favorites, home dogs, away favorites, and away dogs do for the last game of the regular season. You see there's two different sides of the chart. Obviously, Kelly, because from 2015 to 2020, we only played 16 regular season games. The last two years, we've played 17 regular season But what jumps out to me at this, go final week of the regular season, 49.1% from 2015 to 22. And from 21 and 22, 38.9%. And let's take a look at the bottom chart. These are totals for the final regular season game. I broke them down 42 and under, 42 to 48 and a half, and 49 and higher. Take a look at 42 and higher, Kelly. Totals of 42 to 48 and a half have gone a combined 33 and 28 to the over. And totals of 49 and higher have gone 13 and 3 over. So you don't have the same intensity to end the season. There have been more overs than unders for the final regular season game during the NFL. All right. Ralph Michaels WT. That is his Instagram. If you guys are on and active on Instagram, please go over there again. No DMs, please, because I'm not going to reply. Ralph Michaels, you have four systems for us this week. And as you mentioned, it's kind of tough uh, navigating through some of these, but you had some viewers send in a few questions. I did. This is one that we've talked about a few times, Kelly. When you're a division opponent, you play each other twice. Once at home, once on the road. If you lose the first game of the season as a home favorite, you're obviously playing on the road the second game. Going all the way back to 2015, those teams like the Texans, the Bears, and the Broncos have gone 64.1%. So a division foe, and I love what the NFL has done the last couple of years. Everyone plays division foes the final game of the regular season. If you got to win, if you don't got to win, if it means anything for playoffs, if it doesn't mean anything, if it's your division foe, you are going to give max effort. And that's why I love these division games at the end. So Texans, Bears, and Broncos in a 64.1% situation. About home dog and a half or more, playing an opponent off the loss is own favorite. Well, that applies to the Panthers and the Giants. Those teams... Playing a team like the Buccaneers and Eagles that lost as a home favorite have only gone 15 and 49, 23.4% against the spread. So system two says to fade Carolina, fade the New York Giants. System three, you lost to a division foe last time. You lost to a division foe two times ago. You are now a favorite, and the line is less than six. So you're a small favorite. You're from minus one to minus five and a half. Since 2017, those teams like the Chargers, 29.6%. Now, I know you're going to say, KC's not going to play anyone, blah, blah, blah. But again, all I'm doing is sharing the data in these roles. You need to see if it is viable for this week. Fourth and final system for this final regular season week. You're off a division win. You're off a win as an away dog against that division opponent. And now you're playing a division foe as a home favorite. Not a big sample size at all, Kelly, going back to 2017. Only 13 games. 
But the Saints and Packers have gone 12 and 1 ATS, 92.3%, or teams in that situation have gone 12 and 1, 92.3%, says to play on the Saints and Packers. So, System One, second division game, play on Texas, Chicago, Denver. System Two, fade Carolina, fade the Giants. System Three, fade the Chargers. System Four, play on the Saints, play on the Packers. And again, please do reach out. Any ATS questions for the playoffs? If post 20,000 of you that have that question as well, that just didn't reach out to me, I'll try to answer each and every one of them, at least maybe not here live on the show, but in the playoff guide that I'll be posting on my old page at Wager Talk next week. WT.buzz backslash RM is where you'll be able to get that guide. Ralph, hope you have a wonderful and profitable week. We'll see you in the playoffs. Now I'm going to get out of here. No, I don't. Damn it, I got to do a spot with Andy Lang at Bub Sports. The prop prince. Let's bring him on in. Okay, I need it. Give me the best bet. Come on. Well, we're going to take a look at Devin Singletary, and uh, he is one that could get an incentive. It's a hefty one, 165 yards. But I'm really looking at this rushing total at 61 and a half. Both teams are motivated, and this is a Colts team that is just absolutely atrocious at the run. Kelly, since the bye week, if you want to take out the Mitch Trubisky game, because Mitch Trubisky is just terrible, the Colts have allowed eight running backs to go over the 61 and a half rushing total in the last six games. They're averaging like 1.2 running backs per game to get over this total. They're giving up 128 yards rushing per game this season. The defense is decimated by injury. And the last five games that Devin Singletary has gotten double digit carries, he's gone over this total. Some of the teams that he's gone under against are like the Browns and some of these teams that are really good against run. The Colts are not. Devin Singletary, forget the incentives. He's going to get a lot of work. They're going to use him a lot against this defense. Devin Singletary over his rushing yards is a best bet. After this segment, I'm going to need to get high because Andy's got me all fired up. I need to mellow out. I'm kicking his ass out of here at Andy Lang Betts. Joe Ranieri, can you help me out here, please? Well, this might come as a shock to you here, Cal, but uh, I might just be a little bit uh, too high this week, especially if we're talking about the Raiders and the Broncos here in this game, uh, lined at about 38%. I'm just trying to figure out uh, how in the hell are we getting the 38 points in this game when Denver managed to win a game against Easton Stick Barely and barely could put any points on the board. Not to mention, we now know Marvin Mims, one of the big play receivers, uh, pulled his hamstring in that game. Probably not going to go here for Denver. Corlin Sutton with a concussion. Why would he be coming back? I mean, they won 16 to 9 last week. They couldn't score in the uh, red zone with, of course, who is it now, their quarterback again? Uh, oh, yeah, yeah, Jared Stidham. Are you kidding me? And now, of course, the Raiders, who everyone seems to love, is amazing to me here. But the Raiders have essentially been out of any sort of playoff race. And the only fact that we're all thinking that Pierce is going to get the job as a head coach is because that defense has been absolutely phenomenal for him. I am talking elite level here, guys, is probably going to end up getting him the job. So when you come down to it here... I've got the two best units on the field are going to be the defenses. Uh, the two weakest units are going to be the offenses, especially under center. I think this is a rock fight. I am not quite sure how we're going to get over 38 points unless we've got all sorts of crazy pick sixes and uh, punt returns and everything else. I don't think it is. Another road game here for Denver, which feels like that's all they've been on is on the road. When it comes down to it, I think 38 is a little bit too high, expecting too much from these offenses, and when the defenses in all likelihood are going to show up and show out in this game. Gosh, Joe, let's just get the Denver Broncos across the finish line, okay? After Sean Payton oh. decided to bench Russell Wilson, I thought my over eight and a half wins was all but dead. Hopefully, they can get a win here over the Raiders. Okay, we're going to do a different segment, and if you are OG bet on it viewers, you remember this. There's a freight train coming because it's the steam game of the week. All right. We have a road favorite that's catching some steam. And fortunately, there's not 
quick money on the other side. You could still get down before that key number. And that's the Seattle Seahawks minus two and a half against Arizona. The look ahead line had Seattle minus 125. That's what was four as you're going to get. And that's what was expected for it to get the four and even go up higher. But what happened? Arizona beats the Philadelphia Eagles last week. And the market gets sprinkled with a little recency bias. And you now get a Seattle team at a discount who finds themselves in more or less a must-win situation against a team that's been eliminated for a while now in Arizona. None uh, worse than this Arizona team. When I look at both sides of the football, let's talk offensive success rate again, passing and defensive passing success rate. If you look at those metrics, the Seattle side is just so much better on both sides of the ball that this line should actually reflect much closer to about a five, five and a half point road favorite and from there get bet up. But again, the recency bias is obvious. Lay the two and a half before it gets to three. There's already threes out there at the sharper shops um, on the Seattle Seahawks. And let's get some NFL gold for you. Be cautious because some of the times on the final week of the season, they're trying to get out ahead of the news, ahead of which quarterback might start kind of like we bet the Rams early, and today they announced, you know, Purdy's not. So you got to factor that into some. I only have released like two or three premiums so far. I'll give you NFL because college basketball is just way too much. Um, all right, we'll start at the top. Dallas minus team over 44. I told you about the Rams plus four and the under in that game at 43. The Eagles at minus five. Houston, we talked about Houston at plus one. Houston on the money line also. Uh, 463, Chicago plus three and a half. I gave you Seattle. If you could get Seattle at a money line of minus 135 or better, take the money line instead of laying the points. Uh, New York Jets, I knew them. Again, take the money line. Don't take the plus one and a half. Um, it's only worth about even money. Plus one, oh, minus 101. You get plus 110 at a lot of places. Uh, 474. Tennessee, I'd be a little cautious about that one. 475, Denver plus three. 477, Minnesota plus four, plus three and a half. Carolina plus five. And finally, L. Chargers at minus two and minus two and a half. That's what the groups that I move for have gotten down on in the NFL. More volume than pretty much any other week this early on, which tells me there's a of trying to get out in these news and market moves. So again, always be cautious, especially week one and the final week because of all the, the differences in how the market is. Yeah, that is a very good note there from VR. Be cautious in the market. Some of these guys just trying to get out ahead of it, but they're still putting in those buy orders for our guy Ace. All right, we got Barking Dogs. Who is going to play spoiler this week? Joe Ranieri. Well, uh, Cal, I am uh, going to go back to the one team which I can't explain it. I have no idea what they're doing since they suck in pretty much every facet of the game, but they keep cashing tickets. And you tell me how anybody can trust the Philadelphia Eagles. Even Dan, our producer behind here, the Eagle diehard, will not look at the Eagles at this point. And listen. I may be holding a ticket that says under an 11 and a half wins here like you, Cal. I, that may be affecting my judgment here, but I am telling you, nothing that I have seen from this Philadelphia team makes me want to say, oh, it's fine. They're going to flip the switch. They're going to be good to go on the road, met life against the team that has not quit and still manages to be a giant pain in the you-know-what to just about everybody they play here in the NFC East. Now, listen, Philadelphia has owned them. But a couple of weeks ago, I remember watching that game on Christmas Eve and going, when they play in two weeks, where is this number going to be? And if it's anything even remotely close to over a field goal, I'm going to back the Giants here. They showed up last week. They're going to show up with Tyrod again this week. Not to mention what Philadelphia is already in the playoffs. And yes, a win can go ahead and win them the NFC East. Now, they can win, but covering by five, six points, which is where this number was, is a totally different animal. I'm not catching the falling knife. I think they're one and done in the playoffs, Philadelphia. 
And I, this is the giant Super Bowl, this game, this week, at the end of the season. No better way to head into the offseason than with a win against the Philadelphia Eagles. They're going to give them all they can handle, and Philadelphia will figure out a way at some point to shoot themselves in the foot like they have the entire second half of the season. Gosh, Joe, I hope you're right. Ariel Epstein convinced me to take the Eagles. <laughs> Super Bowl losers under 11 and a half wins. And they just went on a tear the first half of the season. I can't believe that this still has a chance in hell to actually cash. So I will be a big Giants fan come Sunday. VR, you have another team that has a chance to play spoiler. But boy, is this one ugly. Like the Giants, I can justify. This one just had an owner throw drinks into the crowd. And you're on yes. the camera getting so excited. This one's gross. I, I, I honestly don't even want to take the points. I just want to money line Carolina on Sunday. Yes. Points are for pussies on this one because this is Carolina's game to lose. They have a reason to play. And what I love the most is that Bryce Young is coming off arguably his worst game. That's exactly when I want to bet an ugly dog like this. Could zoom out a little bit. It's two per game. He had a rating of 93.6. And 110, but he's coming off a game where he had a 53.1 rating, and the team got shut out by Jacksonville. What he's doing, that's exactly the type of, of spot you want to take a team like Carolina. It, when it's so hard to walk up to the window and win the win 10 on a team like Carolina against Tampa that has something to play for. And I'll tell you what. Besides just the, the narrative that I gave, you dig into the metrics. I'm telling you now, Tampa Bay's offense may be a lot better than Carolina's because you got to add in the beginning of the season, weigh that so heavily um, that Tampa just got so far out ahead compared to Carolina. But more importantly, when I look on the defensive side of the ball, Carolina's actually better as far as the metrics that matter to me on covering spreads. They're actually better. So if I could get a defense at home field advantage for this team is as long as it gets. They haven't won a single game anywhere else. This is the only place they could win a football game. They're two and five at home. They're over. Oh, give me Carolina. Forget the points. Tampa season over. And I have a future on Tampa at like a hundred to one. And I'm telling you, Carolina is going to spoil that party. Oh boy. All right. Well, on that note, let's get into those best bets. Week 18, and while best bets have uh, been a roller coaster ride this year, last week with the Colts kicking a field goal and then playing prevent defense, that's about as much as I trust my best bets this year. So take this one with a grain of salt. It has been not the most ideal, but I am going to lay three. Here at home with the Green Bay Packers, who coincidentally are three or 0 and three against the spread as a favorite with Jordan Love. I think we bucked that trend here. Everybody's going to say, well, the Packers own the Bears, and that was generally with Aaron Rodgers. But Jordan Love was still able to go in to Soldier Field and get a win this year, lest we forget. That was just a few, you know, 16 weeks ago or so. He had an awesome victory on Sunday Night Football over the Vikings where he couldn't have looked any better. And I know VR said we don't want to back guys that look too good or guys that look too bad. But I like this Packers team 13 and five against the spread as a divisional home favorite. The Bears, they're going home regardless. The Bears are getting the number one draft pick regardless. They just locked up their mediocre coach for another year, and it looks like they're going to be sticking with Justin Fields. And I will say this, Justin Fields has improved very well this season, but I'd like to say that defense helped him a lot more than we're giving them credit for. Regardless, I think Green Bay gets into the playoffs on Sunday afternoon here. Lambeau Fields, let's call it a 28-17 final. VR. Give me your best bet for this week and week 18 of the NFL. I have a good one, Kel. I have a real good one for you. New York Jets. That's right. Take the Jets on the money line, plus 110. The one and a half is not going to help you. 
Even if it lands on one, it doesn't matter. Plus 110 is a much better bet, EV-wise. And then what you're going to do is, obviously, if you live in my world where we lay 11 to win 10, then you know the value of using the Jets on a teaser. Use it now before the opportunity isn't there anymore. Because if you could get a team up through three and seven when the total is only 30, you got to do it. Even if you hate doing it, even if you love New England to win by double digits, as a sports better that's betting for profit, you have to have that ticket in your pocket. It's just too advantageous. Um, with that said, I just think, number one, they're the better team, obviously. Um, it's not even close when you look at, again, I'm not going to keep repeating the same metrics, but the Jets are just so much better on both sides of the ball, offensive and defensive. Um, the only reason that they're not favored in this game is because of the situation. You look at the series and New England has owned them. Not only have they beaten them forever, um, they've covered, what, nine of the last 10, eight of the last 10 as well. But this is a much different team than that team that dominated those Jets over the last decade plus. You, you got to throw that out the window. Um, and if there's ever a chance for the Jets to get back off their back to finally beat New England, this is the absolute best opportunity you have. Um, and another extreme, if you're going to look at a team with no home field advantage, this is New England. I mean, they've actually won three times more games on the road than they have at home. So if anything, I, I, I want to be laying points with this team. They've played seven times at home. They've won one, and they're favored there. Just doesn't make sense. Take the Jets, take them on the money line, tease them, win or lose. You go to bed knowing you place the good bet. That's the job. Do it over and over and over again, and you'll make a lot of money. If you're worried about cashing that one ticket, then bet that one ticket and don't ever bet again. But if you're doing this for long term to, to make a profit and you're going to be betting again next, day, next week, next month, then Jolly's good bets. And that's what the Jets give you, a good bet. Plus one money line. Yeah, I did put the Jets in a teaser. And how could you not with a historically low total such as this? It's going to be a snooze fest. Let's hope VR cashes that Jets money line ticket. Joe, who is our resident Jets fan, was caught dry heaving oh. off camera. Uh, but yes. hey, that, <laughs> it's got to give you a lot. It's got to give you some solace going into the next season. Oh. oh, yeah, I'll give me a lot of sell. Yeah, I did the same thing. Listen, I've been looking forward to the draft since week three. So it's been really, it's rinse and repeat as a Jet fan. It's always the same thing. Season's over. Uh, I am going to go to something else disgusting that's going to correlate uh, to VR's uh, pick here with Carolina because this is the de facto NFC. Uh, South championship game with New Orleans and Atlanta. So when Carolina outright and beats Tampa, right, then New Orleans and Atlanta at the same time is pretty much going to have an opportunity to decide who wins that absolutely disgusting and putrid division here. One of these two teams has to win. Atlanta opened up five, four, four and a half, five. It's now down to three. I was able to get it with the hook. Because somebody please explain to me what's scarier, uh, betting uh, Dennis Allen as a home favorite or betting Derek Carr as a home favorite in a must-win game. That Those two things frighten me. And while, yes, Atlanta is absolutely nothing to write a home about, absolutely. We already saw Atlanta win the first game this year, even though New Orleans outgained them across the board. If you'll remember, five trips to the red zone and Atlanta's defense stuffed them Every time they could not convert. This is a field goal game. Anything that you can get over uh, with the hook, if it's still available, is the way to go to me. I don't trust New Orleans. I've never liked them. I didn't like them this year with Carr and Dennis Allen. Yeah, I'd rather have Atlanta with three and a hook than have New Orleans laying it in a winner-take-all game. It's Atlanta or nothing for me in this one. I like that one as well. Joe Ranieri, well, there you have it. That's the last regular season show of the year. Of course, we're going to be back with the playoffs. Let's get that recap graphic up so you guys can, you know, cheat for all of you guys that scooted along here to the end. Shout out to VR, the Greek gambler at Greek underscore gambler on X. Make sure you guys are giving him a follow. Also puts out some great content on Instagram. Joe Ranieri at Joe Ranieri Show on Instagram. He just basically 
Bree puts up whatever I put up on the Wager Talk Instagram channel. Make sure you guys head over there as well. <laughs> All right, let's have a profitable week 16. Week 16, I'm, I'm losing. Let's have a profitable week 18, and uh, we'll see you guys for the NFL playoffs.